Welcome to episode number 43 of the Balancing Act podcast. I can't believe that we're doing episode number 43 already. I'm Andrew Tempty, and today we've got Dr. Brandon Tempty joining us. And yes, Brandon is our son. Brandon is also chief resident at Providence Portland in Portland, Oregon, and will be moving into a fellowship position this summer at the University of Wisconsin at Madison in the field of pulmonary critical care. Thank you so much for being here, Brandon. Oh, of course. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, so this is the third episode in our little mini series that's entitled Nobody Wants to Think Anymore, which is our exploration of the often misunderstood skill of critical thinking. Uh, but as always with all our guests, uh, you know, I know most or I should know all of your story, uh, but uh, m- maybe there will be some surprise, some surprises today. But before we get started... Uh, tell tell our listeners your story. Yeah, um, so I grew up back in Wisconsin, and then I went down to Iowa for pretty much all of my schooling. Uh, I went to the University of Iowa for undergrad. Uh, I was just outside Chicago for a master's program before going to med school in Des Moines, Iowa. Um, I was looking around the country for different training programs, um, obviously. I'm a Midwest kid, uh, but it was time to get out and try to explore another part of the country. So I, when I was looking for residencies, I flew all around the country and uh, I landed in this place in Portland, Oregon, um, outstanding clinical program, really wonderful people, um, tons of outdoor stuff to do, which was really great. Um, So I have been out here for about four years now. I've completed an internal medicine residency. um, And now, as I said, I'm doing my chief medicine a uh, year. And so um, in June, I'll be back in Wisconsin uh, near you guys to do pulmonary and critical care fellowship, which will be a lot of fun. Um, outside of medicine, uh, my favorite things to do, I love going out to the mountain out here. The Mount Hood National Forest is one of my favorite places on earth. We do some camping, uh, do a lot of snowboarding throughout the winter, uh, a lot of hiking. Uh, basically, my general rule is the more I'm outside my house, the happier I am. So. <laughs> The uh, Pacific Northwest has been wonderful for that. Yeah, I, you know, I, I talk a lot about multidimensionalism, and uh, I'll just also mention on your behalf that you're a fantastic golfer. Uh, you play a sport called uh, futsal, which is an indoor version of, of soccer. So even though Brandon is an incredibly busy doctor, uh, he also finds time uh, to be multidimensional uh, in that way. And he's also a great singer and uh, plays uh, the guitar as well. Um, so lots of big plugs for you. And, and I did wear my Iowa shirt uh, just uh, so that every, everybody remembers that both of us are products of, uh, of the great University of Iowa. Um, I also like to ask this question, which is, you know, if you had to pick that one event in your life that was just uh, put rocket boosters behind your decision-making processes on where you wanted to go, that, that accelerant for your career, what would that be? Um, so I, I guess when I, when I was thinking about, you know, how my career unfolded throughout residency, which is kind of the most recent stage that I've been through, I picked up a specific moment in time that I really remember the active learning process being super important. Um, everyone's a little bit nervous throughout med school, throughout residency. It's a lot of new experiences. It's a, it's a lot of stress and pressure, um, pressure to get better, pressure to take care of your patients while also learning the art of medicine. Um, and it shot me back to the first code that I ever had the opportunity to run. Now, a code blue uh, is basically a cardiac arrest or a respiratory arrest in the hospital where someone has lost a pulse and they have stopped breathing. Um, so when you're seeing it in the TV shows, it's when everyone rushes in, they're doing chest compressions, et cetera. Um, and so I was an intern out in Portland. Um, I had known that I wanted to do critical care before I even showed up here. And I walked into the room, uh, into my call room, sat down after rounds, had my coffee, and I'm sitting, trying to call some consults, and I hear uh, Code Blue, CCS9. I know that's my young guy with a few kids that I just admitted um, for respiratory failure. And I go rushing over there, uh, attending, standing in the doorway, 
he, uh, all the normal chaos is going off. The nurses have started chest compressions. The uh, respiratory therapists are trying to fiddle with the vent. There's alarms going off everywhere. The normal chaos for, for those codes. And I remember my attending turning to me, standing in the door, and he just looked at me and said, you ready? And I was like, what? And he was like, well, you're going to run this one. And then he turned to the rest of the room and he said, all right, everyone, Dr. Tempty is running this code. And I had studied those cards and the algorithms. I'd seen codes so many times. I'd gone through so much prep work and, you know, passive learning, sitting there trying to absorb all that information in my brain. And I made it through about the first 30 seconds, um, assigning some roles. I delivered a shock. I got the first rhythm. And then he turned to me and said, what now? And I'm sure I just looked white as a sheet. And I just turned to him. And I, if I remember correctly, I just took a physical step back. And that was his cue to regain control of the room. Um, and, uh, and, and take things back. Now, now this, this guy uh, did very well. He actually ended up walking out of the hospital and the code obviously went well, but it was a huge marker in my professional development of the importance of being uncomfortable and really leaning into discomfort uh, as a way to grow both personally and professionally. Um, you know, my mentor in attending, I, I was expecting him to come in and say, what the heck was that? He came in, he sat down, he just said, that was awesome. Great work. Mm -hmm. I, I turned back to him. I said, what are you talking about? I had lasted 30 seconds. I totally flunked that. <laughs> um, and he was like, no, now you felt the pressure. Now you felt the discomfort. You know everything in the books. That's fine. But it's the real world experience that's going to get you where you need to go. And putting yourselves in those uncomfortable positions uh, is really where you're going to find that, that growth period. So the more you do that, the better proud of you for doing that as an intern next time you'll get it now obviously i run codes no problems and very comfortable in those situations but that was a huge point in time for me where i triggered um, the importance of that active learning and it's okay to be uncomfortable if you're in a safe space with great mentors uh, in a great learning environment yep psychological safety experiential learning discomfort, being uncomfortable, th those are the ways that, uh, that, that we learn and grow. And I, I really like that psychological safety aspect of that story that, uh, you know, that your, that, that, that your teacher, your mentor, uh, was re was really there for you. Uh, it could have gone very differently. Uh, you know, he could have yelled at you and made, you know, made you feel bad about your performance. And, you know, we see that play out over and over again. So those are all really, really important lessons. Um, you know, we're here to talk about critical thinking. Uh, but before we get to the main topic, uh, I'd like to thank you and your team members for your service during the pandemic. Um, you know, remember back to the beginning of the, of the show today, Brandon is a pulmonary critical care. Uh, you know, that's the specialty he's going into and COVID is all about the respiratory tract and the lungs. Um, so, you know, you are just right at, in the thick of it. Can you spend just uh, a minute or two letting our listeners know what things were like on the front lines? Yeah. Um, you know, to be honest, it was really isolating. <laughs> um, when the pandemic hit, I was over in Uganda um, with my buddy Eric, and we were teaching at a med school. Um, I actually woke up at 4 a.m. to a call from um, you and mom saying, it's time to come home. Uh, the president's closing the border in 24 hours. Uh, this, is, um, this, is, this is the time to get home. So flew back. Um, the pandemic had not hit Uganda, but it was pretty apparent the second I landed in Portland, there were tents outside the hospital. Uh, everyone was in full gear working uh, as much as they could to help out throughout the hospital. And so, you know, like you said, my, uh, my field being pulmonary and critical care, this was exactly right up our alley. This is kind of why all of us showed up to work every single day was to take care of these, these ill patients. And, and uh, ARDS, which is the, the thing that makes you so darn sick, uh, with COVID and causes a lot of patients to unfortunately die from it was one of the things that I kind of treat as a, um, as a, as a level of interest of mine, an area of interest. And that acronym um, stands for ARDS is what? Acute respiratory distress syndrome. Thank you. Um, yeah. 
basically it's an overwhelming uh, inflammatory response in the lungs um, that causes them to fill up with, with protein and um, undergo significant damage. But the, um, uh, you know, at first, very rewarding, you know, there were people uh, going up and down uh, the street out in front of the hospital, uh, honking their horns, saying thank you. The hospital was doing bunches of stuff. And, you know, at first everyone was, it was very rewarding, but weeks went on, months went on, patients kept coming in, they kept getting sicker, they kept being more and more, the, more of them. You had these very difficult conversations from the doorway using an iPad where the family had to talk uh, to their loved one. It was the only way they could see or communicate with them at all. Um, nobody was allowed inside the hospital. Um, so you, you, you know, you're having these really difficult conversations, telling people that their loved ones are going to pass away um, from this and this problem that they're having, uh, without even a chance to come say goodbye or see them. So, um, you know, when you when you intubate somebody in the ICU at that time, you were the last person that they talked to. A lot of that weighed pretty heavy as the months went on, um, and all of that kind of culminated in it just being a very isolating experience because then on top of it, a lot of the stuff that we would do to recharge our batteries, leave the hospital, go do fun things around Portland, that's all shut down. Yeah. You can't see your friends. Um, you, you feel like if you do, you're going to put yourself in harm's way and then you're not going to be able to take care of the people that you need to take care of. Um, even outdoor events were shut down a lot of the time. So there was, there was not really a way to recharge your battery and it was just a it was just a continuous drain on your energy stores. Um, and I just, I remember it hitting May uh, after about two or three straight months working in the ICU uh, when I finally started to realize that. Um, luckily, things are a lot better now, um, but it's, uh, it's still going on. It's still difficult, but it's a lot better than it was. Well, thank you for your resilience and uh, dedication to the field. It's uh, just in, just incredible. And uh, please uh, get boosted, get get vaccinated. Uh, if you're listening to this and you haven't done those things, uh, please get those things done. Uh, so let, let's talk about critical thinking. That's what we're here to talk about today. What does critical thinking mean to you? Yeah, so this is something I actually sunk a lot of time into throughout my chief year. For for those that aren't familiar with what the chief resident does, um, they're kind of they're part of the medicine faculty, and the primary job is to teach. Um, and so I've kind of thought through a lot of the clinical reasoning process over um, over the last year, and it really boils down to a very simple yet very very complex algorithm. Um, so clinical reasoning for us is basically taking a patient history and data, creating an accurate problem representation of who is this person, what are they coming in with, so that we can develop uh, clinical reasoning skills that we call illness scripts. And what these illness scripts are, they're patterns of disease where it says, you can say, I have seen this before, let's just call it gout. Um, that gout typically looks like a single joint. It's acute onset. It's warm, hot. They don't have a fever, um, and they have these and these and these risk factors. That's what gout typically looks like. Now you compare that with septic arthritis, which is something that uh, come, typically comes with a fever. They're quite ill, but has a lot of the same um, a lot of the same features. So it ends up being comparing very quickly a lot of those illness scripts. To be able to select out of them, what do you think is the best, is the most likely diagnosis, and then from there coming up with a treatment plan. Now, what's really hard with critical thinking in medicine is um, it never shows up like that. <laughs> uh, no, nothing shows up in isolation. Nothing shows up in uh, in textbook form because you know everyone's a whole person. They're coming in with their own backgrounds. They're coming in uh, with pre-existing medical problems, uh, social determinants of health that uh, can complicate things. Um, and then just everyone's own physiology is a little bit different. Um, and so while you're trying to pick out all of these different illness scripts and trying to solve these clinical problems, there are a lot of confounders that go into it. It is never as simple as, oh, I Googled this in isolation and here's what gout typically looks like. I must have gout. Um, and so I, I think that has been a lot of fun to 
dive down and say, well, how do we actually solve these clinical problems? Um, and then once you do actually solve a clinical problem, now you have to go through the next step of the reasoning process, which is finding a treatment plan that's going to fit that individual person in front of you. Again, a lot of confounders that are going to go into that, maybe they can't afford these medications. Uh, maybe they've tried this one and they failed the first line medication, or they have an allergic reaction to something that you want to use. Um, and so a lot of these pieces of data uh, to go through what is a very simple algorithm, but very complex and uh, very difficult when you're trying to apply it to the person in front of you. Yeah, yeah. So in a conversation leading up to this episode, you and I were talking and you're, you, you'd introduced the concept of type one and type two thinking. Can you help us understand the distinction between the two and how that relates to critical thinking? Yeah, so this is actually a theory that was uh, created by, I believe, an economist in the 80s. Um, and so this wasn't really even a theory that was born in medicine, but we use it all the time. And now type one thinking is that kind of intuitive problem solving and pattern recognition where you can quickly say, I've seen this before. This is what it looks like. Problem solved. Um, type two thinking is more of a step back analytic process where you have to look things up. The picture doesn't quite fit a pattern that you've ever seen before. Um, and so you have to identify this doesn't necessarily match with something I've seen before. I'm going to need to look this up, find new, find some answers um, and really dig through the, the analytic process a little bit more. So when we're thinking about type one thinking in our, um, in our field, it's a lot of the times you show up it's an urgent care, for example. You say, oh, I have a sinus infection. Um, you know, fits all of the typical billing for maybe a mild bacterial sinus infection. You give them antibiotics, great. Um, I solved that problem using pattern recognition of something I've seen a thousand times over and over again. I didn't have to look anything up. Um, where type two ends up coming into play is when that person comes back in five days and they are way worse despite the antibiotics you gave them. They did not improve as you would expect. Um, and you have to think a little bit more into this. Well, what are some mimickers of, uh, what are some mimickers of bacterial sinusitis? What can look like this that isn't just your run in the mill bacterial sin sinus infection? Um, and who knows, that person may have a nasty fungal infection and a week from now they're going to be in the ICU. Um, so that, that's how uh, I use that a lot. And I think the major thing that I always have learners take away, and I think the difficult thing when you're going through training is knowing when to use that type one and when to use type two. Because when you're starting in medicine, you don't have a type one. You go through and every single problem is complex. It's all new to you once you enter a third and fourth year of medicine. You've just seen it in a textbook and you're building those illness scripts throughout time. And you get a little bit better at using type one, but you've still got a lot of holes to fill in your knowledge. And so knowing when you have to switch over to type two, and it's like, you know, this story doesn't quite fit and calling that out, I think is a really important skill. Yeah, cool. Um, tell our listeners uh, a one or two uh, quick stories about times in your career when critical thinking was just absolutely essential to a, a success or the avoidance of a failure? Yeah, I, I think the, the example of the type one and type two that, that we were talking about, I think the majority of problems that we see enter the ICU um, were a failure of when to use type two maybe earlier than that they should have used it a little bit earlier than it was initially implemented. Um, you know, we get the luxury of hindsight in the ICU when someone reaches us, it's very often they've gone through the outpatient setting. They've been inpatient uh, on the medical floors for at least a couple of days, gotten some work up. And now we're seeing them because something is going, it's getting worse. It's going poorly. They're not responding to treatments as you would expect. Um, so when you look back and you look through, well, how did this, how did this all play out? You know, I've, I've been in the outpatient setting as an internal medicine doctor throughout residency. And now I've done the hospital wards and the ICU. Um, so I have the luxury to kind of analyze all three of those steps and see well, where, where can we maybe be doing a little bit better with our clinical reasoning? 
Um, things like pneumonias are a really easy example of this. And the one example that uh, comes to mind quickly is a patient with a really nasty, um, again, fungal pneumonia. They were seen in the outpatient setting for a little bit of shortness of breath, maybe mild fever. They had a cough. They got a chest x-ray. It shows a little uh, smuts in the top right corner. Great. Um, where that patient looks relatively okay, I'm going to give them some antibiotics. They'll go home. We'll recheck things in, a, in seven days. Now, they get worse. They actually show up to the ER in about three days afterwards. Um, ER physician, hospital, uh, admitting doctor looks at this, looks through everything. Infectious markers are high. Story fits for bacterial pneumonia. Oh, we may just not have been covering uh, all of the bacterial causes that can lead to someone getting this sick. Maybe we just need to broaden their antibiotics a little bit. Let's get them admitted, give them some IV antibiotics. Another two days passes. Patient's still getting worse. Everything's... Uh, uh, his lungs are getting worse, still failing, and close to needing intubation and critical care uh, at that time. And so you look back through that and you say, well, why didn't anyone step back and think, well, maybe this isn't a bacterial pneumonia. This patient is not responding as you would expect. They're continuing to get worse. That should trigger that type two thinking in your brain of, I need to look up things that can look like this. I need to look up things that maybe while seem consistent in my pattern with bacterial pneumonia, isn't always. Um, because then by the time that we saw them, we got a CT scan. Unfortunately, they needed to get intubated shortly after that. We did something uh, called bronchoscopy where you go take a sample out of the lungs um, and you can actually uh, pull out a really good sample to send to the lab, which is actually pretty hard to get to the lungs uh, without doing that. Just the normal uh, sputum cultures and spitting things up into a culture tray is not very helpful. Um, so we, again, had the luxury of doing all that. And the day later, uh, we get results back that show that this is a really nasty fungal infection. And over the past seven, eight days, despite seeing multiple doctors, both inpatient and outpatient, you know, this person hadn't been touched by a single antifungal drug, and now they're intubated in the ICU. Uh, and this is not an uncommon um, occurrence because fungal infections in the lungs are super uncommon. It's not the first thing you think of. It's not a pattern that you uh, are necessarily fitting into your brain. But there are instances where if, if someone would have, you know, kind of stepped back a little bit early in the hospital course and said, well, wait a minute. I would expect this person to be getting better by now. They're not. This fits this pattern that I have here, but what else fits into this pattern? Um, I think that correct implementation of that type two thinking is, is what staves off a lot of messes in the hospital. Yeah. So what I'm hearing really here, uh, what I'm interpreting is, uh, is is a warning from you essentially about uh, subconscious, uh, what some call unconscious bias, and that that type one thinking, which is the okay, I've seen this before, boom, that you know that must be it. That uh, relying too much on that uh, can really pose a danger. And you know, a lot of people that are listening to this show uh, are business people. They're they're not medical professionals, but they'll. Uh, I, and I'm I'm just trying to serve as a translation layer uh, for you uh, for them because it can get uh, it's really dangerous to rely. You know, go on autopilot and just uh, you know I'll react to everything in a knee jerk uh, kind kind of a fashion. Am I interpreting? Interpreting that correct? Oh, of course, yeah. And, and like I said, this actually comes from an economist. So this this actually originates <laughs> in the business world, and yeah. we just stole it because we don't have time to come up with our own ideas. Um, so the uh, <laughs> so so it, it really in its in its primary emphasis was uh, was shown in examples of navigating your way through the business world, financial decisions, using patterns that you had previously seen. Um, but as you well know, that doesn't, those patterns don't always fit. They don't always play out as you would expect them to. And you need that ability to step back and really think in that in an analytical way using data um, to support you looking up clinical questions, talking to colleagues, et cetera. Um, Cause if you just kind of blast through your day using the type one thinking, it, 
you're right. You're, you're going to fall into a lot of bias traps. Yeah. Um, in medicine, we've got a whole host of them. There's like 40 biases that we could go through. Um, a lot of, a lot of what it ends up boiling down for me when I'm my first step of going to that type two thinking is making sure that I have the problem representation correct, which I think that can apply as well to really any situation. Am I even framing this question correctly? Um, For us, what that looks like is maybe I'm missing a piece of the history. Maybe I'm missing um, some lab information that I should have gotten already. Uh, Maybe there's an image that can help me here and I'm missing a piece of data. Um, Often what I find when they get that sick and they reach us is we do a really thorough history of stuff that can happen. And you've got someone with bad respiratory failure. No one ever asks them if they've got birds in their house. And, oh, by the way, I have 12 parakeets (laughs) and this person has something called hypersensitivity pneumonitis um, or or bird lung. Um, But I was missing that piece of data. So my framing and my problem representation when I thought about it initially with my type one thinking was incorrect. Right. Um, And I think that happens in the real world all the time. Yeah. So you just celebrated a birthday that uh, has a number that starts with a three. I'm not going to tell everybody exactly how old you are, but um, it, uh, you know, you're, you're closer than certainly I am uh, by definition to your initial training years. Um, You've been through a lot of training, a lot of education. How do we build critical thinking skills in our collective population? The the average uh, individual on the street, how do we lift, uh, how do we raise the bar uh, for everybody? Uh, what are some of the key uh, sub-skills that, uh, that we need to be teaching to, to, to move the needle here? I think when it comes to the collective population, this would be, um, I'll switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about some other critical skills that we use, critical thinking skills that we use. Um, For us, that's called evidence-based practice or evidence-based medicine. And basically what it boils down to is how to evaluate your data sources to make sure that I'm using a data source that applies to this patient uh, in particular. Um, Does this actually fit my need? Um, Does this treat the patients that I am trying to treat? Does this even answer the question that I'm trying to answer? Uh, Is this a study that's from a reputable source that I can rely on? Did they study enough patients? There's a lot of questions that go into it. And I think, honestly, as hard as it would be, I think everyone in the population just needs an hour on an evidence-based medicine course. Um, Because in the current age, what I see with a lot of problems with, uh, with critical thinking is that problem representation is wrong. Their, their, their way of, of thinking about it is built up with a lot of incorrect and inaccurate data or misleading data um, that really shouldn't be applied to a certain situation. I think that's how we end up talking on two different planes is because my problem representation of really any controversial topic you look at uh, might be very different from the person next to me. And that's because the data that I'm looking at uh, was interpreted in a very different way and sold to me in a very different way. Now, what I try to use is obviously very reputable sources through medicine. We use the New England Journal a lot. We've got JAMA. We've got a lot of really awesome journals that go through aggressive peer review. Um, But there's a lot of sources out there that are not reputable, but nonetheless, it shows up in the database that can be used by the general public, used by news outlets, et cetera. And you can basically use data to tell whatever story you want to tell. The ivermectin uh, drug that came out is a really good example of this because there's a lot of strong data that came from very reputable sources that says this does not make a difference. We did a large randomized control trial, which is the gold standard of evidence-based medicine. Um, and we found no difference. We potentially found a little bit of harm, um, but there were some in very shady journals from other parts of the country that are not treating the patients that we see here. Um, that didn't go through a great peer-reviewed system 
it's written by a master's student out in Iran. And the, there are some news sources that label themselves as entertainment news sources that are using that to try to push their ideas on it. But you go through the data that they're using and they have basically spun this paper and called it medical science and data in quotation marks um, to try to tell their story. But if you as a consumer have the ability to go through and say, well, wait a minute, this is 40 patients studied in this trial. This one studied a thousand. This one correctly put all of their different um, patients into the correct allocations and randomized them. This one picked and choose who they want to study and why they want to study them and which bucket they're going to go into and basically rigged the results. Uh, those, those, two, those two papers tell a very different story. And if we interpret both of them as truth and as the best science that's available, that's really dangerous. Yeah, that whole uh, uh, horse wormer ivermectin uh, story is uh, is interesting, and I just want to be clear to our listeners that uh, neither Brandon or I have any uh, uh, thing against uh, master's students. We were both master's students at one time, <laughs> in one form yeah. or another. Uh, and uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, you get get your data from uh, multiple reputable sources and know what questions to ask and and how to frame a, a good question. So we're we're getting close to time here. Uh, before we sign off, I'd like you to assume that you have an audience of prospective medical professionals listening to the show. You know, younger individuals who are thinking about getting into the field. What do you? What advice do you have for somebody uh, that's uh, that's thinking about entering the field of medicine? I think the first piece of advice I have is for anyone trying to really enter any field, and we've touched on it at the very beginning of this with the Code Blue story. But um, finding mentors in a safe space um, that will allow you to push yourself, be uncomfortable, um, give you the space to to fail at times, and uh, I think that'll really help with your growth, no matter what you're going into. Um, I've been blessed throughout my entire training and my entire life to function in a safe environment where I felt um, where I felt comfortable putting myself out there, putting my chips on the table. And some days I'm going to lose them and some days I'm going to keep them. Um, but the only way that you can progress is to play the game. So I, I think that's probably the biggest thing. Um, that I would say now to people going into medicine in particular, um, especially if they aren't in it yet, uh, find out who you are as a whole person before you go into medicine. Yeah. Um, I think so many people go into um, go into careers and into medicine without having the time to explore what's important to them. Who are they going to be outside of medicine? What are their hobbies even going to be? I mean, in, in our field, you've got a lot of folks that sit down and crush through books for four years in undergrad, getting the best scores that they possibly can, which does not allow you for much of a personal life. Um, and they frankly forget to go make these connections, uh, find out what's important to them build relationships, uh, find what's going to sustain you when the, when the, when the tough times come, um, they, you know, they and, and will advance directly into their medical school where things will get even harder. And then they'll go into residency where things are still hard. Um, and, uh, not having that kind of full, well-rounded approach to your life makes it really tough and causes a lot of burnout. So find what's important to you, before you go into a lot of these processes so that you can keep and uh, sustain them along the way. Um, because yeah, the journey gets tougher. Undergrad is not the hard part. <laughs> um, it's, it's a time to explore who you are, what are you about, uh, build some relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that plug, uh, for, uh, personal purpose. Uh, I, I've, I, I've developed, uh, a short personal purpose exercise uh, that's in one of my Saturday morning muses on the website uh, to help individuals uh, explore their personal purpose before uh, they make decisions about uh, about uh, career change or, or where they're going uh, in life. 
Uh, and I think uh, that's just absolutely essential. So Brandon, thank you so much uh, for your time today. Uh, we're, uh, we're, uh, I'll, I'll look forward to future conversations uh, with, with you uh, on the podcast. Uh, this is Andrew Tempty. Uh, you can find everything at andrewtempty.com. Uh, please uh, subscribe to the podcast, uh, like it, rate it. Uh, give, us, give us as many stars as you possibly can. And uh, we will see you next time.